Hello everyone and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series where we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the Deep Clue C Precon for Murders at Karlov Manor and its face commander, the legally not a merfolk, Morska Under Sea Sleuth, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $40 price point to an increased budget of $75 after upgrades. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content, and if you really like it, please consider supporting the channel directly either through Buy Me A Coffee or through our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what Precon Upgrade we'll be covering next, and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Morska Undersea Sleuth is a 2-3 Vidalkin fish detective that costs Bant and has the following three abilities. Firstly, we have no maximum hand size. Secondly, at the beginning of our upkeep, we investigate. And thirdly, whenever we draw our second card each turn, we put two plus one plus one counters on Morska. Breaking down her core stats, Morska is sporting a lower mid-weight CMC, a low power average toughness stat block for her cost, and a trio of abilities focused around clue token generation, and taking advantage of drawing cards across multiple turns to both fill our hands and to turn her into a legitimate threat. Jumping straight into Morska's last ability, which more or less sets the tone for her entire playstyle, it functions as a simple draw payoff that can very quickly turn our commander into a gigantic threat as we draw cards, potentially allowing her to accumulate up to plus 8 plus 8 worth of stats per rotation. Now, to be fair, this only triggers on the second card we draw each turn, meaning we'll need to engineer ways to reliably generate card advantage outside of our turn in order to make the maximum use out of it. Though thankfully, our slice of the color pie has no shortage of ways to do just that, while also having access to plenty of draw and second card drawn per turn payoffs to generate us even more value alongside our commander. And while on the topic of generating card advantage outside of our turn, Morska's second ability helps us achieve this through its passive clue token generation, which we can at base use as an easy means to proc our second draw on our turn to proc our commander's growth and other draw-centric payoffs, or, if we stockpile them and or use them in conjunction with Bant's other sources of investigate, we can easily use clues as our primary source of drawing cards on our opponent's turns, as well as using them to generate us value through other means thanks to Bant's myriad of ways to take advantage of clues, artifacts, and tokens. And finally, since Morska wants us to be drawing up to 8 cards per rotation, her passive ability to remove our hand size limit is appreciated to not only ensure we don't waste resources by having to discard down to hand size, but also helps us set up any cards that care about our cards in hand to make them even more effective. So, as we can see based on Morska's abilities, she's primarily a draw-themed commander with a focus on drawing cards on our opponent's turns to make herself into a gigantic commander damage dealing threat, while also providing solid support to clue token creation game plans, and the base build does a fantastic job of leaning into nearly all aspects of her kit providing us with plenty of clue and non-clue-centric draw sources to ensure we can reliably draw cards both on and outside of our turns, a good selection of payoffs to take advantage of our draw to generate us more value or to harm our opponents with, and a respectable number of ways for us to weaponize our clue token creation to either make cracking them more efficient, or by using them to generate us value and board presence without us having to use them up instead. That said, while this deck does have a lot to like out of the box, including some powerful and much needed reprints, it does have two glaring flaws that we'll need to address in order to bring it up to its full potential. Those being an absolutely glacial mana base, which contains a staggering 14 lands that always come into play tapped, and its quite frankly pathetic removal package, which consists of only three pieces of real removal, which results in the base deck being very slow to start and having very little ways to interact with our opponent's plays. So we'll be aiming to improve upon both of these categories by adding in faster lands to help quicken up our mana base, as well as much more interaction to take advantage of all the mana we'll be leaving up on our opponent's turns to crack clues anyway. 
Then, with the base build's biggest issues fixed, it's just a matter of refining what the deck is already good at to help bolster its performance, which will consist of adding in more sources of investigate so we can get more clues into play and use them to draw more reliably outside of our turn, as well as slotting in additional ways for us to make our clues more efficient, or that use clues to generate us value outside of card draw enabling Morska to drown our opponents with her gigantic stat block and a huge amount of resources will be accumulating, both figuratively and literally. So let us make our way to the waterfronts of Ravnica's many districts, where we'll usually find Morska assisting the Wojax in any investigations that would require her underwater expertise. Not too long ago, she would have never even dreamed of working alongside guilds outside of the Simic, as the grudges between the factions on Ravnica made cooperation rare, if not impossible. But that had all changed after the Phyrexian invasion, where she witnessed firsthand her fellow guild members willingly turning themselves over to completion, betraying the entire plane to further their insatiable lust for evolution. Far too many of them had to turn their back on Ravnica to fuel their selfish desires. So, once the conflict was over, she in turn turned her back on them, sickened to her core at their actions and willing to do whatever it took to atone for her guild's misdeeds. So now she volunteers wherever her underwater mutations are most useful, working alongside the Jects to maintain peace and order for the people of Ravnica, and, hopefully, to undo at least some of the damage that her guild inflicted upon them. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's jump straight into the upgrades. Now, the very first thing we'll be correcting before we move any further is the core build's land base, as its glacial speed is too much of a liability when it comes to the deck's overall performance. As such, we'll be replacing the Bounce Lands Azorius Chancery, Selesnia Sanctuary, and Simic Growth Chamber with the Reveal Lands Port Town, Fortified Village, and Vine Glimmer Snarl, all of which take advantage of our basics and lands with basic land types to usually come into play untapped, thereby speeding up our mana base without sacrificing consistency, cutting the Scry Lands Temple of Enlightenment and Temple of Mystery in favor of the Czech Lands Glacial Fortress and Hinterland Harbor to further take advantage of our basics to quicken up our mana base with, and terraforming our last Scry Land Temple of Plenty into the Pain Land Yavamaya Coast, which always comes into play untapped, and, once we don't need the colored mana anymore, we can always tap for colorless to cast our spells and crack our clues with to avoid dealing damage to ourselves, all of which bring down our amount of lands that always come into play tapped down to 8, which is much more manageable, especially when considering that 5 of those lands have cycling that we can use to contribute into drawing our second card each turn when we draw into them. Then moving on to fixing the base build's other main issue, its lack of interaction, we'll next be focusing our efforts on improving our removal suite to better deal with our opponent's threats as they come our way. For example, we'll be removing Serene Sleuth from the build, which is a much too specific silver bullet, but I would recommend leaving in if we know we're going up against the blame game precon, as well as Hornet Queen, which doesn't really fit into our game plan at all as a non-clue non-artifact token generator, to make space for counterspell and disruption protocol, both of which provide solid spell disruption to help protect our boards or hinder our opponent's plays for, usually, the cost of cracking a clue, follow the bodies, whose Gravestorm effect is interesting but its sorcery speed really hampers it, making it only really usable as a follow-up after we wipe the board or after we crack a lot of clues on a single turn, two circumstances that don't occur too often, and Temple of the False God, which is just an outright terrible land in general, will both be replaced with Beast Within and a Generous Gift, each of which give us incredibly flexible removal to deal with a wide variety of threats on the board, and Benching Aerial Extortionist, which is admittedly already a repeatable removal source, albeit a slow, expensive, and temporary one, so we can give its spot to Path to Exile, which is significantly more efficient thanks to its cheaper cost and ability to remove threats at flash speed allowing us to use it in response to our opponent's threats on their turns instead of cracking clues if we need to, unlike its predecessor. 
Then staying on the removal refinement game plan for a moment, but pivoting into clue token creation as well to fuel our primary game plan with, we'll be removing Whirler Rogue from our lineup, which is admittedly okay at enabling our commander to get in for damage, but competes with better options already included in the deck that either passively make her evasive, or that tap down blockers while fitting better into the deck's playstyle, to open space for Duggan, Private Detective, whose stats scale with our cards in hand to take advantage of all our draw, investigates as he swings in to generate us more clue tokens and card advantage, and we can use as a once per game one-sided fight effect on top of that to shore up the build's low removal count as well, and Sophia Dogged Detective, who deserves a dog-themed build of her own, but isn't reliable enough here, with Tiny being her only target that she can grow and that can proc her, so we'll be replacing her with another legend, Kellen Inquisitive Prodigy, whose adventure side provides us with some serviceable ramp and clue token generation initially, and when we cast him properly, lets us repeatedly pick off our opponent's back row, or, if we'd rather, he lets us destroy our own clues so we can turn them into card advantage at no mana cost, freeing up our mana to crack more clues on our opponent's turns. Now, with the two glaring weaknesses of the deck properly shored up, we can concentrate the rest of our budget into augmenting the build's already solid clue generation to net us more draw and or more artifact tokens into play for our payoffs to take advantage of. Therefore, we're going to be cutting the somewhat generic board wipe Fumigate, as we already have some more on-theme and more flexible options in the deck, and replacing it with Tamiyo's Journal, which provides us with some solid passive clue token generation each turn to work alongside our commander, and, on top of that, also serves as a repeatable tutor as we stockpile our clues to dramatically increase the build's consistency, removing killer service, which is okay as an option to turn our clues into bodies, but again loses out to effects already included in the build that generate us bodies as we crack our clues to draw cards, which is what we primarily want to be using them for, in favor of thorough investigation, which nets us extra clues as our ever-growing commander or other creatures swing in, which is solid enough, but then also generates us even more value through venturing into the dungeon every time we crack a clue on top of that to net us even more resources, shelving confirmed suspicions, which is far too mana intensive for a counterspell even if it does investigate, especially now since we're including more efficient removal in the build, so we can give its spot to Sarah Jane Smith, who provides us with another cheap and surprisingly consistent source of clue tokens between all the artifacts and legendary creatures the base build has and that we'll be adding, sidelining Nadir Kraken, whose mana investment for token creation can be put to better use by simply cracking more clues to proc our better payoffs, to put in Wojak Investigator, which can create upwards of three clues for us per rotation, making it a superb early drop when we're still getting our draw engine online to get more clues into play, and firing an Oculus Researcher, whose on attack symmetrical draw into token creation on a middling body is at best unreliable and at worst impossible to use, while its cost of shutting down most of our interaction against our opponents to untap our lands is just too high a price to pay, in my opinion, to hire Forensic Gadgeteer in its place, which can still provide somewhat reliable clue token generation as we cast our artifacts, and, even if we don't get that much use out of its token creation, we can still put its ability to reduce the cost of cracking our clue to use to draw more cards and proc more payoffs per rotation. Then moving on to some new additions we'll be adding to the build's already very respectable selection of clue token payoffs to help us generate even more value off of said clues, we'll be scrapping Thought Monitor, whose best case scenario of being a 2-2 evasive body that draws us 2 for a single mana is solid, but the fact that it's at sorcery speed and that this build isn't equipped to reliably recur it makes it less good here than it would be in other builds, so we can add in Aliquist Prof to Master Sleuth, whose ETB Investigate is okay but whose real draw is being able to turn a single clue into multiple draws, which does end up being one mana more expensive to draw two cards instead of cracking two clues, but only costs us one clue to do it and gains us life as well, which is worth the extra mana in my opinion as well as recycling the Investigate-themed Mana Rock Magnifying Glass into the better Investigate-themed Mana Rock 500-Year Diary, which provides us with an absolutely insane amount of ramp once we get our clue game plan rolling that only gets better as we stockpile more and more clues. 
then pivoting into some new payoffs that care about our clues being artifacts to generate us value instead, which again, this build has a number of impressive members of already, but we can always use more of, we'll be cutting the scalable draw source Hydroid Crisis, which loses its spot due to incentivizing us to pump huge amounts of mana into it to draw a huge amount of cards all at once, instead of drawing cards for us incrementally to proc our commander and other second draw per turn payoffs more than once, in order to add in the legend himself, Urza Lord High Artificer, who would have earned a spot on this list alone for being another way to turn all our clues into mana rocks and turbocharge our mana base as soon as he comes down, but also provides us with a scalable token body that grows as we make more clues, and serves as a mana sink himself to get us more spells into play if we need to, making him well worth the price, and Finale of Revelation, which is again a good draw source, just not ideal here since it gives us all that draw all at once, so we'll be replacing it with Rise and Shine, giving us one more way to turn all our clues into bodies to crash into our opponents with out of nowhere to help us close out games. And finally, as the last pair of new entries we'll be adding to the build, we'll be replacing the far too symmetrical card draw source Silvala Explorer Returned with the token's matter payoff Jahira Friend of the Forest, who slots in perfectly alongside our other token-centric payoffs by turning all of said tokens into green mana rocks, including our non-clue tokens, to again give us access to all the mana we'll ever need as soon as she comes down, and scrapping the two unfocused egg ransom note in order to make space for wizard class which provides our already impressive draw-focused arsenal with yet another way to weaponize our draws, this time by growing Morska at double the rate as we draw our cards once it hits level 3. So, now that we've covered all 24 cards that we've upgraded from the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this precon upgrade. This deck currently has 30 creatures including our commander, 7 instants, 3 sorceries, 11 enchantments, 12 artifacts, 1 planeswalker, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 18 cards that investigate, 13 cards that specifically care about clues, 8 cards that care about artifacts, 6 cards that care about tokens, 6 cards that care about our second draw each turn, and 3 cards that care about whenever we draw a card leaving us with a rock-solid clue-focused build with plenty of ways for us to get clues on board, alongside a solid selection of payoffs that can take advantage of every single aspect of them to generate us value or to weaponize them while they're on board, or as we crack them to generate card advantage. Then for general deck stats, we have 16 ramp sources, 25 card draw sources, 8 targeted removal sources, and 3 board wipes. Our draw being off the charts in this build as we're primarily a clue-focused deck that wants to be drawing as many cards as possible across any given rotation, our ramp being slightly higher than average to help us get the mana needed to crack multiple clues to generate that card advantage, and our removal, while slightly lower than average, is significantly improved over the sad three sources we started off with, so we'll take it. Looking at our mana curve, we have 4 1-drops, 17 2-drops, 16 3-drops, 14 4-drops, 5 5-drops, 4 6-drops, 3 7-drops, and 1 10-drop. Leaving us with a mid-weight curve that aims to get our clue token generation online as quickly as possible, either by us making a beeline for our commander or by casting our other sources of passive clue generation. And from there, it's just a matter of adjusting our playstyle depending on what we have in hand, resulting in us either stockpiling clues if we have a variety of artifact payoffs at our disposal, or cracking them instead if we have more clue-focused ones. Either way, we'll be generating huge amounts of value while we do so, while simultaneously growing more sky into a bigger and bigger threat, until we're poised to drown all our opponents with our gigantic commander, the huge amount of value we generate, and our army of weaponized clues. The final price of this build then comes out to be $75.41 after upgrades. This price does not include tax or shipping and assumes that the price you paid for the precon was $40. The price of most of these cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording, though for a few of the newer cards still on presale, pricing on Card Kingdom was used instead. 
Now, for side grades, we can consider replacing Wizard Class with Officious Interrogation to help us bolster our clue production by potentially 10 or more in a single shot, though at the cost of not being able to generate as much value off of those clues as we use them to draw, Wojak Investigator can be cut in favor of Thousand Moon Smithy if we want to go in the opposite direction by cutting our clue token generation and increasing our ways to weaponize our clues by being able to repeatedly create constructs whose stats scale off our artifacts in play, and, depending on how their final prices shake out, we can replace our monocolored cycling lands with the Clue Edition Investigate dual tapped lands to give us the means to create more clues from our land base, though making it much more mana intensive to generate card advantage off of them. Then for further upgrades, Benny Brax Zoologist can be traded out for Cyberdrive Awakener, which gives us yet another way to weaponize all our clues by turning them into evasive bodies as soon as it comes down to enable devastating alpha strikes. Graph Mole can be swapped out for Displaced Dinosaurs, which again weaponizes our clue token creation, this time by permanently turning our clues into 7-7 dinosaurs as we create them that we can still crack for draw if we need to. And, of course, since we're a token-focused deck after all, we can replace the much-needed and generically good reprints Chulain Teller of Tales and Coma Cosmo Serpent for the token-doubling Mondrak Glory Dominus and Anointed Procession to kick our token production into high gear, or Parallel Lives if we want to save a few bucks by buying the green version of it. Though considering their price, it would be the equivalent of opting out of getting the extended warranty on a new sports car. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. So, now that we've covered the Deep Clue C precon, it's time for us to climb into the crypts to explore the Revenant Recon precon, along with its face commander, the Lazav Consumed Conspiracy Theorist, Mirko Obsessive Theorist. So look forward to a surveil and reanimation build featuring him coming soon. Then moving on to our first poll for the Murders at Karlov Manor set, as is tradition, we'll first be giving the alternate commanders of the Precons a chance to helm a build of their own. With this week's contenders consisting of the self-targeting spell duplicator, Feather Radiant Arbiter, the dog-empowering investigator, Sophia Dogged Detective, the clash-centric spell-cheating cephalopod, Marvo Deep Operative, and the bear-enabling bear, Duskana the Rage Mother. So please cast your votes in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and which commanders you want to see me feature from Murders at Karlov Manor in future polls. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you're feeling particularly generous, feel free to keep me caffeinated via buying me a coffee at the link in the description, or alternatively, use our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description if you're looking to purchase sealed MTG product, accessories, board games, or any of their other wide selection of products at low prices that include free shipping for orders over $75, and a rewards program that builds up store credit over time as you make your purchases. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut-rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.